Polynesia, a word that rings like a soft and mysterious invitation. Ever since they were discovered by the first explorers, these small islands, gently strewn on the vast Pacific Ocean, have fascinated by their beauty and rekindled us in a myth of paradise on Earth. Yet the cliché smartly nurtured by tourist brochures eclipse a world, a people, stories, a culture, and characters and flavors that can allow you to truly appreciate Polynesia, but for the right reasons. From Tahiti to Tuamotas, with a stopover in the Marquesas Islands, we are heading to the edge of the world for a journey and encounters that will be particularly colorful. For two centuries now, whenever people heard the word Tahiti, their faces would brighten up. The largest island of the archipelago has even become synonymous with Polynesia. But the visitor expecting a postcard landscape may be disappointed. Tahiti's charm lies elsewhere, in the uninhabited center of the island. Like the walls of a grandiose fortress, impressive volcanic peaks surround these mysterious valleys. Papet, the capital, is almost a mandatory stopover. After the spectacular expansion of the past 30 years, the city now resembles a modern metropolis with its unavoidable problems. Yet once beyond the crowds and traffic jams, the capital's charm and vitality unfold. The special public transportation buses called trucks are a pleasant way to blend into Papetti's daily life. The centrally located large market hall is an excellent departure point to explore the city. On the ground floor, discover the fresh produce and the extraordinary variety of fish brought in from the fishermen during the night. The stalls offer a wide range of typically tropical fruit and vegetables such as pineapples, watermelons, papayas, hairy lychees, and bananas. The fragrances and bright colors of the flowers liven up the perfume of the market. Upstairs, traditional Tahitian products, clothes, and handcrafted products include sarongs, straw baskets, flowers, and hats. The famous necklaces made of seashells and mother of pearl are made on the marketplace. Papet, like all of Polynesia, also lives to the rhythm of these religious ceremonies, an important aspect of the population's social life. This Protestant temple was built on the site of the island's first church, celebrating the birth of the city in 1818. The Sunday service is worth the detour to see the mamas all dressed in white and wearing magnificent hats. In the large rooms of the town hall, the mamas are participating in the contest of the most beautiful tifefe, a decorative cloth with flower designs used as a tablecloth, a bed cover, or curtains. This technique was inspired by the wives of English missionaries. Today, this craft is directly threatened by industrial products. Tahitian women remain attached to this art and wish to pass it on to generations to come. These encounters are an opportunity for them to leave their workshops and transmit their passion with enthusiasm. We have been making tifefe for a long time. You can use it as a bed cover, but most of the time it is a gift given to personalities, to people who are getting married. It really is a know-how of the Polynesian mamas. We leave the Papeti suburbs along the coast. The fishermen have just brought in their boats full of fresh fish. As soon as they're on land, everybody starts to work making garlands of atcher, fish that is eaten raw. <laughs> Venus Point is an important center for nautical activities. Several Parag racing clubs gather here. It has become a sport today, but the Parag is also a crucial element of the Polynesian identity. According to several legends, large parags were used for major migrations, although all vestiges of boats that used to accomplish these fascinating voyages have disappeared.
dancing is also a major element of Polynesian culture and identity. For a long time, it remained a form of entertainment for tourists associated with the image of the vahine, the voluptuous Tahitian women. But Polynesian dance deserves to be stripped of the cliches that stick to it. It is just as specific to Polynesia as Biguin music is to the West Indies, a cultural and popular heritage, a privileged means of expression shared by all Polynesians. Every show requires months of rehearsals and years of practice. The choreography has a legendary meaning. In this country of oral tradition, dancing isn't only a matter of aesthetics. It also preserves the memory of a people and has, for the past few years, known a genuine revival. For the younger generations, it is an opportunity to devote themselves anew to their culture and reconnect with their roots. To enjoy more peacefulness on the waterfront, we head for the north of the island. The landscape becomes wilder as the coast is beaten by the swell. A few surfers enjoy this famous spot. A surprise awaits us under the pressure of the strong swell. A geyser soars from the rocks through the blowhole. Turning our backs on bustling papet, Exploring the northern peninsula is a journey into the Tahiti of old. The population wishes to protect it from wild urbanization. Here, the majestic nature, the peaceful villages and beautiful landscapes still prevail. From the high plateaus, a strange surprise awaits you. Here, the landscape looks like the French countryside with its green fields and cows, an amazing discovery in the middle of the Pacific. We continue our exploration towards Teahupu. This must be at the edge of the world. The road stops here, and nobody can imagine that someday it may be extended to preserve this little paradise. Teahupu is famous for its surfing spot. Its impressive wave attracts the world's best surfers. But Teahupu mainly lives to the rhythm of fishing boats coming in and going out to sea. Due to intensive fishing techniques, large shoals of bonito have become increasingly scarce. Nevertheless, local fishermen try to carry on their activity and bring back fish that is mainly eaten raw. In Paia, there is a moray, a ceremonial site of the ancient Polynesian religion. Abandoned following the wave of conversions to Christianity, they were then restored and Tiki once again adorned them. These sculptures depict a legendary character, half man, half god, the origin of humanity. The day is slowly coming to an end. One last time the Perot crews head out to sea in the sunset. One can stay here and simply admire the views that offer a grandiose spectacle to the eye just before twilight. A beach livens up to the rhythm of percussions. The sun is disappearing behind Morea Island that faces Tahiti. We'll be going there tomorrow.
Morea is the charm island of Polynesia. Its beautiful jagged profile forms a dazzling backdrop. Only 20 kilometers separated from its sister island, Tahiti. Nevertheless, in more ways than one, it is very different. Its charm is due to a clever mixture of mountains and rugged volcanic peaks, a turquoise lagoon, lush greenery and exotic flowers, a protected environment and a relaxing atmosphere. The beautiful steep mountains of Morea tower above the coast. Their sheer drop-offs are a spectacular view. Morea is famous for its two large bays that form deep indentations on the coast dominated by Mount Wolltui. At the far end of the bay, a road leads inland and follows a valley lined with pineapple fields that stretch to the hills and on the red earth of Pau Pau Valley. After the arrival of the first Europeans and Christianity, the ancestral Polynesia culture almost disappeared. It is mainly through archaeological finds that the specificity of this civilization was discovered, and more particularly that of the Marae, these open-air sites that were dedicated to religious, social, or cultural activities. Facing Tahiti, the lagoon offers an exceptional setting where you can enjoy the relaxed atmosphere on the beach. In ancient times, copra and vanilla were the island's major crops. Today, pineapple plantations have taken over. But in Pata'e, Fajara would love to, once again, enjoy the wonderful scent of vanilla pods. Beyond Pataye, other bays have remained protected from building projects. They are excellent observation points for the abundant marine life. A little further down the road, Haipiti, the most spread out village on the western coast. The Church of the Holy Family, built on the mountain, is a major attraction here. Stonecutters from Easter Island used coral and limestone to build it. A sudden shower refreshes the air and recomposes the landscape in different colors. While touring the island, you can't miss the fields of tiare. The flowers of these small bushes are the symbol of Tahiti. To produce monoi oil, the famous skin and hair care product, the tiare flowers are macerated in copra oil. Temai Beach is a meeting place for those who enjoy traditional local sports. They are taking part in the qualification round for competitions that will be held during the island's important festivities in July. <laughs> Among the different disciplines, the javelin is no doubt the most spectacular and the most difficult. You have to plant the javelin in a coconut attached to a post several meters above the ground. The strength testing disciplines are also very popular and attract a big crowd. In the stone lifting event, strong Polynesian men must lift and stabilize on their shoulder an entirely smooth stone that can weigh up to 100 kilograms.
An almost ordinary day ends under the Polynesian sun. Every evening, its last rays beautifully illuminate the vast Pacific sky. Leaving the Society Islands, we are heading for the Huahine that belongs to the archipelago of the Leeward Islands. Huahine doesn't have the haughty airs of Morea or Bora Bora, less spectacular than its sisters, carefully avoiding the traps of media coverage. Huahine is discreet and, to a certain extent, prefers to stick to the sidelines. It cultivates a punctilious particularity. Tourism arrived quietly on a modest scale. A tour of the island suffices to be won over by this suave nonchalance that invigorates the body and mind. A rare fish lives on the island's rivers, a blue-eyed eel. For the Polynesians, this fish is sacred. They are thus generously fed by the population. There are many fish farms in the bays of the island. This technique is several centuries old and still in use today. These parks are set up in a V-shape to trap the fish and built with blocks of coral. You can easily see where they are thanks to the little cabins where the fishermen sit. These archaeological vestiges remind us of the historical importance of the Polynesian island. Fare is the largest village of the island. The islander meet and exchange the latest news in its shops. As in all of Polynesia, the inhabitants of Huahine are very attached to their lifestyle and their territory. They maintain an almost sacred bond to their land. Descending from a royal family, Queen Mama Penny shares with us this special bond that considers the island as a living being. We see the head, the breast, and the stomach. She is laying down. During the pre-European period, Maiva was the seat of the island's royal power. The leaders lived on the edge of the lagoon, on this strip of coastal land, and practiced their religion on their ceremonial sites. These marae are still visible near the coast and on Matarea Hill. Miles of empty beaches unfold on the wild shores of Huahine. Sheltered by the vegetation, the Mare Manunu is a massive construction once devoted to Tane, the god of war. The nearby fish farms are still in use. Contrary to appearances, the island isn't a single piece of land, but two separate islands. These twins, who share the same lagoon, are joined by a narrow isthmus a few meters wide and a bridge. At low tide, you could almost cross over on foot. Huahine's landscapes are less rugged than most of the other islands of the archipelago, but its outline is pleasantly cut out and magnificently graceful. The Polynesian archipelagos are a stunningly beautiful spectacle and offer great diversity. The all-too-frequent image of a paradise with golden beaches and coconut trees does not reflect one of the most precious assets of these islands, 
the inhabitants that have throughout the centuries known how to preserve a lifestyle greatly inspired by an exceptional environment. Many Polynesians have become aware of the wealth and originality of their culture. During a visit to these remote islands, meeting the population is an enriching experience. A window opened onto the world, a people, its customs, and legends in good humor. The last visit to Huani Itzi, where the beaches are the most beautiful and the lagoon the largest. Bora Bora certainly is the most famous Polynesian island. Few have visited it, yet its name is familiar to millions of Westerners who believe it is part of paradise. For many years now, it is proud of its envied status. For travel agents around the world, it is the Pearl of the Pacific. Here again, cliches endure, but Bora Bora isn't merely a product on a tourist brochure. Several villages like Anao and its typical Polynesian lifestyle aren't subject to tourist pressure. The schools remain an important element in terms of transmitting identity. In addition to classic subjects, the children are initiated to traditional activities such as music and dancing that allow them to explore the myths and legends of the origins of their people. But if an authentic Bora Bora exists, the image of the island is closely linked to its enchanting setting. The postcard, the view, preferably from the sky, embodies the tropical dream. And unquestionably, Bora Bora cuts a fine figure with its volcanic peaks, its lush vegetation, its huge turquoise lagoon, and its string of atolls, or motu, lined with white sand, covering the coral reef that certainly justified its worldwide reputation. The Bora Bora Lagoon is the largest of the Leeward Islands, and the manta rays are reign here like queens. But the island has a hard time resisting the hotel industry pressure that could endanger the fragile balance of this exceptional place. Dominating this unique landscape, Alain Despair owns a home that gives entirely onto the lagoon. Alain is a painter and has decided to set down his easel here to compose an original expression of Polynesia, carried out by the grandiose setting that inspired him. This is the most beautiful and pleasant painter's workshop in the world. I have never worked in a place like this before. Whenever I paint Bora Bora, I always include the Otamanu and Bahia Mountains. I'm used to this perspective. The lagoon is an exceptional observation point for the marine life. You can regularly see whales here. For those who love thrills, a wakeboard experience will allow them to get a closer taste of the power of the elements. The 
somewhat off the beaten tourist path, the evening starts to the rhythm of percussions, songs, and dances. The Anuo troupe is actively preparing the July festivities. The boat remains the privileged means of transportation on the lagoon. At any time of day, sky, water, vegetation and light compose a permanently striking spectacle with constantly changing atmospheres, yet every time unique. Within a short hop from Bora Bora, Rayatea Island has remained very natural. After tourism, pearls represent the island's second source of revenue. Strings of grafted oysters are immersed in the lagoon. Layer after layer, the mother of pearl thickens around a perfectly spherical tiny bead of six millimeters that grows one millimeter per year. 18 months later, a fine harvest is done. Installed on stilts in the middle of the lagoon, the pearl farms are equipped with lifting and maintenance platforms. Cultural pearls require a very specialized labor force. The harvest is always a surprise. For Moana Constant, as in the other farms, more than half of the grafted pearls don't take, and only 5% will be perfect. The color spectrum is wide, from pearly white to black, or aubergine to champagne. The iridescent reflections and the luster are also major elements in defining the quality of a pearl. I'm working with the rejected pearls. I first have to sort them out by color and by size. I then create jewelry that has a Baroque style. It is very much in style here. The second largest island of the Society Archipelago, Rayatea cultivates its difference. Less touristy than its neighbors, it is almost a mandatory stopover for those who are interested in traditional civilization. The island's nickname is Rayatea the Sacred and plays a symbolic yet crucial role in mythology. It used to be the religious center of Polynesia. Surmounted by Mount Tamahane, the main mountain chain rises at the center of the island Access to the beaches on Rayatea isn't easy, except in certain very isolated areas. To laze around and swim, it's best to be taken to an atoll. Rayatea has managed to prevent a large influx of tourists, which explains the absence of luxury hotels. The center of the island is still very agricultural. With a humid tropical climate, Numerous varieties of fruit, as well as peppers, are grown here. The island has many assets. The beauty of its lagoon compares to those of the other islands. A pirogue ride around the island is the best way to appreciate it. Rayatea shares its lagoon with Taha its sister island that can only be reached by boat. Taha well deserves its name, Vanilla Island. 
At the beginning of the century, vanilla was a flourishing activity on the archipelago. Production reached 200 tons. Today, it has dropped to less than 25 tons. One of the highest quality vanilla varieties is patiently grown under the shaded nets. It is a delicate and very technical process as reproduction requires artificial insemination. Once harvested, the pods are brought to specialists such as Mami Chan, who has always lived among the plantations. It automatically turns brown after four days if the vanilla had reached its maturity. We leave them in the sun, and a few days later, we sort them out. Some of them are wrinkled, others are still very smooth and have to be put back in the sun. The lagoon, with its numerous pearl farms, is strewn with its holes along the edge of the coral reef. Rayatea is the cultural, religious, and historical center of the Leeward Islands. According to legends, it was the departure point for the major navigators who swarmed the Pacific. The first king of Rayatea is said to have been Hiro, the god of thieves and sailors, who, with his companions, built the large pirogues who crossed to Rarotonga and New Zealand. The island then became the religious center devoted to the god Oro, the important marae complex of Taputa Puatea, the most important one in Polynesia, is devoted to him. Oro, the god of war, dominated Polynesian beliefs during the 18th century. The marae spreads out on a large surface and dates back to the 17th century. Despite its relatively short history, it has played a major role. Copra is another major activity. As in all of Polynesia, the palm groves are very important for the harvest of coconuts. Its edible part is precious to the production of an oil frequently used in the cosmetics industry. The islands of Rayatea and Saha are two pretty jewels that are often forgotten by those who succumb a little too easily to the Bora Bora myth. These islands have managed to preserve their charming, harmonious, and simple small village atmosphere. They still have a sweet scent of serenity, a timeless nonchalance, just like the smiles of those who kindly greet you. The Marquesians call their archipelago Tehenua Enana, the land of men. The term Marquesas was the name given by the first European explorers. This archipelago is the most southern of French Polynesia. Only six of its islands are inhabited. There are blocks of lava that sprung up in the middle of the Pacific and permanently seem to defy the immensity of the ocean. Partially submerged craters form vast amphitheaters where rare villages nestle. Taoae is the only agglomeration of the Marquesas wrapped around a magnificent bay. It is the economic and administrative capital of the archipelago. At the beginning of the 19th century, on Nuku Hiva, Taoha Bay welcomed boats carrying sandalwood and whales who came here to rest. Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, had been hired on a whaleboat, but took advantage of this stopover to leave and stay here. On the Marquesas Islands, or the lands of legend, archaeological vestiges abound. Most of them have not been inventoried by specialists. 
The valleys are genuine open-air museums where the spirits of the dead prowl and represent the treasures of memory. It rains very often on the Marquesas, where numerous spectacular waterfalls hurtle down the plateaus through the basalt. The sudden changes in light only underline the feeling of power and mystery that emanate from the mountains and valleys. The uninhabited, virgin expanses of the Marquesas are absolutely striking. Only 8,000 people live on the archipelago. Prior to colonization, the population was estimated at 18,000. It then dropped to 2,000 in 1926. The crews of whaleboats, most of them adventurers from around the world, brought with them alcohol, weapons, syphilis, and other epidemics. The colonial administration and the missionaries did not care about the ancestral values of the Marquesian people. However, the number of inhabitants slowly increased again and revived its old values. Today, the very low population density, given the available space, leaves room for this fascinating and exuberant wilderness. The island has only recently begun to open up to tourism, but those who are curious enough to venture here are quickly spellbound by the atmosphere of mystery that permeates each place, by the hospital population, by the feeling of being at the edge of the world, and by the osmosis with nature. It is raining this morning in Tsaohai. After spending the night at sea, the fishing boats are returning as the sun rises. Around the Marquesas, fish is still relatively abundant despite the large trawlers that practice industrial fishing in Polynesian waters and threaten the natural reserves. At times, the catch is more plentiful than planned, largely meeting the population's need for raw fish. The surplus will be salted, then smoke-dried and sent to Tahiti. Heading north on the road that runs through the island, the climb towards Teavata Puhiva Pass is impressive, with the Mayuriki waterfalls in the background and Hatua Bay on the other side. Continuing north, the archaeological site of Kamuahea has recently been restored. The place is spectacular due to the strange atmosphere that emanates from the large boulders of basaltic blocks and the presence of huge banyan trees. The importance and number of these structures is a witness to the former high population density of this valley. It is thought to have been ten times higher than today's. We finally reached the northern coast. By following it towards the west, through numerous verdant valleys, the island spreads its extremities towards the ocean, cutting out here and there beautiful bays where you feel alone in the world. The road leads us to a rocky promontory surmounted by basaltic peaks that dominate the valleys and bays like impregnable citadels. Close by, Hatihu Bay seems much more peaceful. On the waterfront, a few tikis, the only witnesses of a human presence, seem to enjoy, unperturbed, the setting and the shade of the coconut trees. 
They seem to delimit a sacred space where man is only a passing guest. The inhabitants of the island and local representatives have legally translated their respect for the wilderness by prohibiting any construction on the waterfront while giving priority to a tourism that respects nature. One of the most beautiful bays of the island, Anaho, can only be reached by boat. Several families live in this peaceful village where time seems to have stopped. A coral shallow with a beach, unique in the Marquesas Islands, developed here and reminds us of a lagoon. The bay surrounded by a mountainous cirque is perfectly sheltered from the winds in the swell and offers one of the best anchoring spots for boats. Craft lovers will be delighted in the Marquesas. Sculpture, a particularly popular art form, has its own school in Tao Hai. The young students learn the mandatory forms under the supervision of their master, Daniel Hachura. This artist has spent his entire life sculpting. We owe him monumental works that decorate the Cathedral of Tao Hai. We discover, sculpted in a tree, the statue of His Lordship Dordillon, the Bishop of the Marquesas from 1848 to 1888. The Cathedral of Notre Dame was built on the site of Tahua Mauia, a sacred and venerated platform of the ancient Marquesians. The stones used to build it were brought from six habited islands. Marquesian craft has an excellent reputation throughout Polynesia. The artisans work with rosewood, too, and sandalwood, or basaltic stones. A Marquesian craft fair is held every year in Papet, during which the best artisans of the archipelago can expose and sell their work. Tattoos are also very much in style, even beyond the Polynesian area. Today, the Marquesian designs are a real trend. For many years, missionaries considered that tattoos were undesirable, but today we are witnessing a renewed interest in them. Woodwork is also very appreciated. The artisans make tikis, plates, spears, and paddles. In most of the villages, small centers expose part of the production and sell it directly to customers but nothing is worth a tour to see the sculptors at work and exchange a few words with them. Leaving the Marquesas for the Tuamotus, the contrast is striking, a switch from profusion to austerity. Imagine a chain of 77 atolls strewn across a rectangle measuring 500 over 1,500 kilometers. Imagine coral rings just above the water the posthumous witnesses of intense volcanic eruptions. Contrary to their appearance, the omnipresent corals in Polynesia are neither rocks nor plants, but animals. They are produced by a multitude of small organisms. They are fragile and often threatened by man. The most stunning fish and their beautiful colors can be observed in the lagoons. These atolls constitute a fragile and vulnerable setting. Due to the absence of mountains, they aren't protected against cyclones. The sparse and poor soil, as well as the absence of fresh water, make growing crops quite difficult. 
the population of the archipelago, called the Paumotu, had to deploy incredible ingenuity to adapt to this hostile environment. Today, the situation is slowly improving, even if the Tahitians still consider the Taumotus as a backward world. The production of copra was encouraged and has become a major activity today. During the 19th century, the only Westerners living in the archipelago were Christian missionaries. Catholics and Protestants competed for the evangelization of the local population. And this competition explains the diversity of the religions in the archipelago. Catholics, Protestants, Mormons, Adventists, and Sanitos. Several villages, such as Tehuahara on the island of Tikahau, are particularly charming with their rows of urus, coconut trees, bougainvilleas, and hibiscus. Here, dancing also strongly belongs to the cultural identity of Tuamotu. An uninitiated visitor could confuse the style of dancing with Tahitian dances, yet the costumes are different and the legends are specific to the Tuamotus. Near the village, the beaches are invitations to dive into the clear blue waters. These atolls of the Pacific don't offer a large variety of itineraries, yet they also have their secret paths. You really have to be born here to reach the beach of Heine's Bell, totally protected from prying eyes, the ideal meeting place for lovers. These atolls are without a doubt extraordinary places to spend a few days vacation. They offer a time-suspended experience. You've reached the edge of the world, the last stretches of land before the blue immensity of the ocean blends with that of the sky. For a long time, sailors were scared by the idea of reaching the limit of the earth and the seas. They believed they would be thrown into an infernal drop. They couldn't imagine that the world ended in Polynesia. Palm groves were planted for the production of copra, the only other possible activity on the atolls, besides cultured pearls. Nowhere is aquatic tourism more beautifully expressed. It unquestionably represents a means of development, but the fragility of the natural setting, and more particularly the rarity of fresh water resources, prohibit any large-scale exploitation, which is good news. One doesn't visit the Tuamotus to satisfy a passion for museums, monuments, or partying. The activities are invariably related to the enjoyment of water. The most promising, certainly, is deep sea diving, which opened the Tuamotus to tourism in the 1980s. Here, boats remain the only efficient way to travel on the lagoon. Frequent shuttles connect the various hamlets. When a deep sea diver hears the word Rangaroa, his eyes light up. 350 kilometers north of Tahiti, Rangaroa has become a tourist destination in itself. Every year, thousands of divers come here to experience the great thrill of the underwater passes, where the water is constantly renewed and attracts an exceptional concentration of fauna, among them sharks. The innumerable amount of powerful sharks that can be two meters long are, of course, well-fed and not dangerous at all for the divers who want to see them close up.
The Tuamotis is the last stopover of a fascinating journey. The possibility of experiencing the subtle alchemy between entertainment and pleasure, nature and culture. Polynesia is a labyrinth of sensations in which it is a pleasure to simply get lost, following the sail of a boat or the wings of a seagull.